Well, well welcome everyone. Um, I, I think we'll, we'll begin uh, partly because the exhibition that you've come to is very rich and really we need to allow you plenty of time to uh, uh, have a sit down or pause over some of the monitors, put some headphones on. There are a whole lot, of, there's so much here uh, to, 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 to see. Um, we're very fortunate with the weather. Um, it's a beautiful day here in Melbourne and, and I think we're very privileged to be here in the house of Robin and Patricia Boyd. Um, it's one of those very rare occasions that we have a lot of people in this, in this space. Before I begin though, I'd like to acknowledge uh, that this exhibition and this event takes place on taken land. We pay our respects to the traditional custodians of the land, the people of the Kulin Nation, particularly the Wurundjeri and the Bunurong. We're sitting on the border of those two uh, people's lands. To their elders past and present and emerging, sovereignty was never ceded. So welcome to the House of Ideas, um, an exhibition which has been really organised and undertaken by students in the Melbourne School of Design at the University of Melbourne. And they're all around you, the students, uh, and really it's without their incredible research and incredible dedication to this subject, it uh, wouldn't have taken, taken place. Yes, cheers to the students. Yes, so congratulations. Well done. The, the, the thing that I should say about an exhibition like this, uh, the students have undertaken this research in just 12 weeks. So normally if you're planning a big exhibition, it's two or three years in the making. So what you see around us has been really put together uh, in a very short time. But in many respects, that's testament to the richness of the career and life of Robin Boyd, which is why we're here today. The subject that the students mm -hmm. undertook uh, uh, was with uh, me, Philip Goad, and also Alan Pert, who, there's Alan, up, up on the balcony. <laughs> and uh, really, in terms of the whole curating of the exhibition, uh, Alan has been the uh, the ringmaster, one might say, uh, for making sure it all happens and getting us all to the finish line here, here today. Um, before we begin, I'd like to thank those some people. Uh, thank very much the students of our subject, which is called Critical and Curatorial Practices in Design. This is the fourth time we've run this subject. Uh, in previous years, we did an exhibition on motels, on David Yenkin's motels in Gippsland. We did another one on merchant builders uh, and uh, last year was an, another exhibition in a, an important house that was in the uh, Ernest Fuchs house in Caulfield and the exhibition was called Ernest Fuchs The House Talks Back. And in this year we've done it here in the Boyd house and we're extremely grateful to the Robin Boyd Foundation for uh, allowing us to do this. And in particular I'd like to thank Alison Pert at, at the back there. Uh, also Tony Lee, who is here, the former director of the uh, Robin Boyd Foundation. Tony is the, really the expert on Robin and his uh, uh, collections generally. Uh, I'd like to thank Akis Gokmen, who helped Alison and the students with the exhibition. Michelle Berder, who helped you with the catalogue, and I think everyone should take, get one before they leave. Um, the chronology inside was uh, undertaken by Toby Dean and if you have any corrections please let us know because part of what this is about is also a giant work in progress to increase the knowledge of Robin Boyd and his career and for things to be unearthed. And we've had extraordinary help from a lot of people uh, uh, of giving us directions and hints to new things and we can point some of those out. I'd like to thank also very much Lois McAvey from the State Library of Victoria, the manuscripts and the pictures collection. Um, she really get, opened the door for us at the State Library. Um, I'd like to thank also too, um, very importantly, Amy Boyd, um, a direct relative of Robin Boyd's. It was Amy who, in many respects, allowed us to show some of the things which we were a little uncertain about, um, but we're very, very grateful, Amy. Um, it's an extraordinary privilege to be able to show some of the things here today. I'd like to thank also Norman Day, uh, Hans Lu, uh, Liu, who did the fishbowl project upstairs, had a great interaction with Norman over the fishbowl. 
Uh, Kristen Stegley, thank you very much. It's been fantastic. The material that's come uh, through about steg bar window walls. To Simon Jackson, who very kindly lent us the original uh, catalogue of the 1949 Red Cross Homes exhibition mm -hmm. as well. Um, also upstairs, there are some films which uh, uh, probably never had a public showing, and Angus and Lucy have, at very last minute, uh, put uh, 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 organised for those films to be shown. Um, uh, they're films which we there is interesting provenance, uh, and later on upstairs, if people want, we can talk more about that, that as well. Uh, I'd also like to thank the other two people here on the stage because we're about to have a conversation. Uh, Mary Featherston uh, was intimately involved with uh, uh, work at the Expo 67 and onward, and Peter McIntyre, who will, worked very closely with uh, Robin Boyd on the Sunshine House. And it's Peter's images here, his slides, which he very kindly lent us, and which, if once you go inside and look back, you see this incredible colour from slides taken back in 1951, uh, and they've never been shown publicly. So what we're going to do is, uh, for about 35 minutes or so, uh, I'm going to have a conversation with uh, Mary and, and Peter about their interactions with uh, Robin Boyd. And uh, I hope we'll have some time for some questions, potentially from the audience as well. So, uh, Peter. Um, your involvement with the Sunshine House. What, how did you come to be involved and uh, what was your input? <coughs> well, it was about this time of the year, 66 years ago, and uh, Robin received a call from uh, a guy called Hugh Ferguson. Hugh Ferguson was uh, a band that was going to play quite a bit of impact in Robin's life and also in mine. Uh, and he, uh, he, he ran a company which organised... Uh, events and he'd organized the Holmes exhibition in the uh, original exhibition building uh, and he asked Robin if he'd build a house inside the exhibition building and um, he'd only come to this idea uh, later in, I suppose it was partly because he uh, didn't sell all the space that he was trying to sell so there was space left over and he came up with the idea that he would get Robin to design this house. Robin had an incredibly high profile he, he was writing these articles for the Age Small Home Service uh, every Monday morning, and it was a complete talking point in Melbourne about, about uh, these articles and what he would say. Uh, and of course, the one of the reasons for this is there was so much interest in Melbourne in housing. In 1951, it seems it was about five years after the war, uh, there was tremendous demand in Melbourne for housing. Houses were being built on the perimeter of Melbourne uh, with no services at all, no roads, uh, no sewer, people were using septic tanks. Uh, it was a, a tremendously difficult period. Materials were short. It wasn't, in, in, in just before that, for us to actually build a building at that time, we had to get a permit for the materials. No, no permits for planning, no permits for what the thing looked like, just a permit for whether you could get some bricks or timber or anything like that. There's a shortage of everything, and you can imagine why, because servicemen coming back from the war uh, would uh, uh, marry and have families, and uh, they'd want housing. Uh, so there was this colossal interest, and of course Robin uh, had such a high profile about it, because he was devoting his life to influencing people as to what they would do, how they would build, and what, what, what Melbourne should be looking like, and how we could be more logical. He, he was literally devoting his life to bringing to get Australia to have some sort of rational approach to the country they lived in, to understand its climate, to understand the circumstances we're in, materials that we had, and what we could do about it. And we could do about it in a much better way than we had been. He wanted to destroy what was called the Great Australia Plan. You all know a house, houses in Australia have the main bedroom pushed forward, the front door beside it, not the living room, but the lounge room on the other side of it with a fireplace chimney, and then double doors back to the dining room, and the second bedroom stuck on the side, four foot away from the paling fence, and the kitchen facing the back. Didn't matter whether it faced east, north, west, south, or the moon. 
that was going to be the house. And it didn't matter whether the block of land was 50 feet wide and 100 feet deep, or if you were going to build it on 500 acres out in the country, it was still there. The difference was in the country, you'd always enter in the back door. Right. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Robin took this opportunity. And of course, it, it was a, a difficult opportunity because it, there wasn't much time. Uh, and we had to get organized about, about, about a builder. I, I'd met Robin, uh, he was my tutor in 1948. And um, he, um, we immediately took to each other, I, I, we, we shined. And I, I produced the first architectural review at Melbourne University in 1948. And um, I got him to start writing scripts. This is how I started working with him. And uh, <laughs> I'd, I'd, the, the, the architectural reviews were devoted to uh, social comment, but in particular comment about architecture. And they were fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I used to spend my whole year waiting for the next architecture. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, and this is how I started working with him, and we started doing projects together. We'd, we would make a, 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 came up with the idea of making films at half time in the reviews. So we started making advertising films. That's where we met Eric Kerr, and after that we started making many, many films with Eric Kerr and, and Robin. So I was used to working with Robin. A at the time when uh, Ferguson rang Boyd, I, I just finished working with Robin on what was called the Survey of ta Taste. Um, I, I was also working at the same time with him on Cross Section. Cross Section was a um, magazine published all over, spread, spread all over Australia, and uh, we would um, get, we had in, people in different states and they would send us information of what new buildings were being built. And um, I would be collecting them all and, uh, and doing all the Victorian ones. And then Robin would come in uh, at, at my, our place and he, he would then make comments on each building. He would, he would make the whole paper in two hours of writing comments about every building being built in Australia. And then send it round. Yeah. That was so we've got, we've got a few copies of cross section in in the kitchen, which you can see. Okay. So I, I was used to working with projects with Robin, and um, and I but but I always take different roles. In the case of reviews, I'd be directing the reviews, and and then I'd uh, get an idea of what I was going to do, and then I'd get him to write a script around it. Uh, and uh, in the case of films, the same thing. He we we decide together what the overall sort of structure of the whole thing would be. Uh, and then uh, he would write the write a script and then I would do the uh, directing and the filming. Uh, but in the case of working with this particular project, I was what you call uh, uh, the, the go-to boy. <laughs> I was there at his beck and call to do whatever was going to crop up. For example, the builder would say, oh, look, we, haven't, we can't get this particular material. This material's not, not available. He said to me, go and get a material like it. Go, get it. You know, and I have to go and, and find it. So he, he, he designed every aspect of the uh, summer house. But he did give me one opportunity to design something in, this, in the uh, Sunshine House. He, he gave me the job of designing the dog kennel. <laughs> I was petrified he wouldn't like it. But anyhow, I designed the dog kennel in the summer house. And I think in all the photographs and everything else about the summer house, you won't see my dog kennel, I don't know why. <laughs> Peter, can I ask about the colour? Um, did Robin have a particular approach? The, col the colour on the slides that we see are so brilliant. That must have been uh, a strategy of his at the show to actually, in a way, shock people with the colour? Well, this was his goal. His goal was to shock the, the complacency out of Australian people. He, he wanted them to shake up and realise that they had not been doing things the right way in Australia. And he wanted them to come to see the new ways that, that, that modern architecture could open up their whole way of living. And uh, he, uh, when I was listening to you on the uh, radio this morning on the ABC, uh, you were saying the same thing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that was his goal. And, and of course, the, the building this, this uh, Sunshine House was just part of that. I mean, he, he wanted to shock them. And the colour, well, I mean, he introduced all sorts of things in the design of the Sunshine House, changing the plans, moving the kitchens, take the, having a new sort of concept about housing and opening them up to the grounds outside. But uh, the colour, well, colour was a very interesting point. In the, um, firstly, the 1940s in, in Australia, we had a terrible, terrible policy, the white Australia policy. 
No one was allowed to come to Australia unless they were white. That's the most extraordinary thing. That was the Australian government's policy. Robin said, we don't have an Australian white policy. We have a cream and green policy. Mm -hmm. Because everything was painted cream and green in 1940. There was no bright colour at all. It was all cream and green. So he said, the Australian cream and green policy, we're going to change. And of course, there was no colour during the war. Everything was grey. You couldn't get a chance of colouring anything in during the war. It was blackout. Everything was black, just like us. <laughs> black. And uh, <clears throat> he, uh, all of us, even people, any, anybody, wanted to get out of that blackness and that greyness. So there was a, a reception to colour. And of course, colour is the most dynamic thing that you can do to shake people up. And uh, there was a company that produced some magnificent paint. It was called Tip Top. Tip Top Paints. And they had this extraordinary, uh, we'd never seen anything like it, range of colours. And uh, Robin splashed them around the house. <laughs> uh, I don't think really that he, in doing that colour, I, I, he wasn't really designing the colour to, uh, he didn't have a bedroom that you'd want to sleep in with the colour. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, to, you know, when Robin would design a house, he, the colour was very important to create the mood of the certain parts of the house he'd want to do. The, the Sunshine House didn't do that. The Sunshine House had a bedroom, four colours and four walls. You wouldn't want to sleep in. He wanted to wake people up. <laughs> yeah. So he, that's what colour was being used for. And, and it certainly shook Melbourne up. Uh, it was built up on a stage uh, and uh, people could uh, be in front of them, look up the stage, and then they would walk through it, go upstairs and walk through it. And uh, they'd come out the other end, different person. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Mary, can I ask you, your, your involvement with um, Robin at Expo 67, H how did that come about and what, what was the involvement? Ah, oh, well, Robin was commissioned by the Australian government. Can you hear me? Because I haven't got a loud voice like him. <laughs> <laughs> can you hear um, yeah, so he, he was commissioned by the Australian government in 1966 to create an exhibition that would tell the world about Australia. But the sad thing was, um, he was only commissioned to do the exhibition, not the building. And so the building was done by the government, yeah, James government architect. The government architect. A fairly unremarkable building, as Robin said. Yeah. <laughs> um, but Robin was such um, an empathetic designer that he he realised that people uh, get very weary and tired walking around these huge international fairs, you know, world fairs, they were just ginormous. And um, so he conceived the idea that, that he would create a comfortable salon uh, with wall-to-wall -wall carpet, which I guess is very Aussie, isn't it? Mm. A very, and white. Um, and that there would be individual comfortable lounge chairs that people could sit in, rest their feet, and you would get the information about Australia through the headphones. So the information would come to you, not that you had to work too hard to get it. It was brilliant, absolutely mm. brilliant. So that we, and we've got an example of, of one of the talking the chairs, chairs yeah. up, upstairs. So um, he came to Grant. In fact, we just got married It was our, and formed a partnership. Um, and so it was the first project we did together, in fact. And I remember Robin giving us a sketch of what he had in mind. He said, you know, something like a wing chair. Um, so he gave us this little sketch of a sort of traditional wing chair stuck on a, like a, you know, a spiky point, a central column. And it was quite comical, really. <laughs> but it, 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 it conveyed the, yeah. it was brilliant yeah. it was, well it conveyed the idea and the function um, so the challenge to to us well, particularly to Grant was how do you create a chair that does this job it's very functional really you know you've got to get the speakers close to the ears of the sitting person you want them to be comfortable you want, as Grant always did, for the shell of the chair to support the body comfortably, but also to reflect the sort of organic and curvilinear shape of the body. Um, so that was one issue. But the other was, how do you relate 
the person, the visitor, and these individual chairs to this huge, voluminous space. Was you know very it's big, big. Um, and so the, those things are you know going going through Grant's mind. Um, so yeah, so that's how it came about. Right. And just to, a link back to the Sunshine House. A lot of the furniture in the Sunshine House, Peter, was, was from Grant, from Grant yeah. Featherston. Yeah. Yes. Mm. So there's a lovely sort well, of connection. Grant mm. was one of the teams that were, were working with Robin, all trying to change things. Yeah. And mm. Jimmy and, Horton James. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And photographed by Wolfgang Sievers. Yes, that's right. right. Yeah, but they're all so there. it's a team of people. Yeah. You know. right. yeah. And in terms mm. of uh, the Expo 67 pavilion, did you go and visit? And no, oh, no. In, because in we, Grant? No, really? <laughs> no, because we were too busy, because the next job was to do the fit out for the gallery. Oh, the National the, Gallery the, of Victoria. Roy right. Grants had designed, um, controversially, the gallery, um, and Robin had intervened, it's a long story, but anyway, we ended up doing the fit out, and that was just a huge job, and again, very short timeline. So mm -hmm. the other challenge with the expo was that, you know, with all exhibitions, Lots of potential. Lots, uh, yeah, it's a fantastic we, medium. And, yeah, and we Robin, all know it. <laughs> you all know it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> love it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but Robin, you know, again, he was so brilliant. He understood the potential of that medium because it's temporary. You can do things you can't do anywhere yeah. else. You know, it's yeah. very, very exciting. Um, but very short timelines. I think we had eight, mo eight months to produce these chairs and. Uh, there were 240 of them, and they had to get to Montreal, where the fair was, before the snow. So right. um, they had to be transported, and also they had to be lightweight. So we were, it, timing is everything. You know, it was just very fortunate that a local progressive furniture manufacturer called Danish Deluxe uh, were making Scandinavian furniture under licence and they got the licence for a technique called plasmurbla, which is expanded rigid polystyrene, like a surfboard. Um, and Grant immediately saw, oh, it, so it's an injection moulded system, so you have a jacketed mould and the beads go in as mm -hmm. beads and then they expand and fill the cavity. So for Grant it was fantastic because you could just, as he said, put the material wherever it's needed for strength or, you know, you can get fine edges. It was just a, a perfect um, material. And the other thing is that it's, even though it's injection moulded, it's not high pressure. So you can use an aluminium mould so it wasn't as costly. It was a bit quicker to produce than, you know, standard injection moulding. But the other brilliant thing was that it was lightweight. You know, you can pick up those shells mm. easily. And so it was good for transport to right. Canada. Now, I'm going to ask a question of both of you with uh, what, what do you think Robin's perception of the success of the Sunshine House was or not? Mm -hmm. Did he think there were things that didn't work with it? And similarly with Expo 67. Mm -hmm. So, Peter, can you, you go first? Um, I think that, I don't, I don't remember what Robin said, but Everybody was very chuffed because it was very successful. Robin's concept was so novel that it got a lot of publicity. And people loved the fact that they could come and sit comfortably, hear the information in English or French, and then there were exhibits, say the Parkes Radio mm. Telescope, that you, so you could sit back and you'd be listening to it, and uh, maybe being described by a, a scientist and there was the model in front of you. So it had a lot of publicity, um, despite the fact that it was cheek by jowl with um, Fry Otto's wonderful you know, tent building. So it had stiff competition. Mm. But and, and can you, mm. uh, just a technical thing, the chairs were very light, you have the speakers, but were they connected to electricity or did they have... Yeah. Right, so each yeah. one had a little power cord. Yeah, yeah. so under the seat, you had a seat cushion and then rubber webbing under the seat cushion. And as you sat, you, you, the movement of the webbing triggered the uh, switch to start the tape. Fantastic. So it was brilliant. And so <laughs> there was a lot of work with the uh, government um, acoustic laboratories to, to work out all that technology. So it was yeah. a real, it was a multimedia presentation. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So Pete, Peter? 
Well, the Sunshine House was a huge success, a, a, a brilliant success, in that uh, the queues were stretching out right up to, down the street to get into the, the building. And of course, that made Hugh Ferguson very happy because everybody had to pay. And, uh, so, <laughs> and of course, it was a great uh, talking point. I mean, it, it was just, it, and that's what it was meant to do, to create a debate about, about Australia. And, uh, and there was plenty. Now, Robin used to, it just didn't mean that every time Robin did something that everybody praised him. There were a lot of times that people criticised him. Uh, and uh, he, but he used to use those opportunities. He, he, would, he would actually publish, he, he'd, re, he'd receive a letter criticising him for this Sunshine House. They'd say, uh, like, there was this reply I can explain to you about. He'd get a letter, but he wouldn't just be sad and put it in a drawer. No, he would publish the criticism and then he'd publish his response because he would see it as an opportunity to actually spread the word again. Mm. <laughs> in the case of um, Sunshine House, someone wrote and said, uh, look, it's not another house, it's a, it's, it's a chook house. You know, it's just like a chook house. It's not another really house. So he published this letter criticising and then his reply. And the heading to his reply, a chook house is not necessarily a foul house. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, that's just thing. I've said earlier that uh, Ferguson played a part in our life. Well, he played a part in Robin's life because he, he was not only an entrepreneur and sort of a, a adventurer, but he, he, he had a real feeling for architecture. And he, uh, he, he uh, it wasn't just money for him to get that building there. He, he, he liked the idea of promoting this idea. And he gave Robin many, many commissions. But it changed my life, this Sunshine House. And I'll tell you how it changed my life. Uh, I learned that he was a Q councillor. And uh, I had designed my own house in Q. Uh, and it was zoned a brick area. I don't know any of you are old enough for me to know what a brick area was. But a brick area meant that you couldn't build any house in Kew, in this part of Kew, unless all the outside of the house was brick. So that's how brick veneer was sort of invented, because people couldn't always make solid brick houses, they were too expensive, so they built a timber house and skinned it with brick. And I said to him, look, I've designed this house in, in Kew, and I, uh, I've just finished paying for it. I was about four years paying for it. And I said, I know I've designed it, uh, and um, I, can't, I just don't know I'll be able to build it because it's a brick area. So I told him about the land, and he said, well, uh, how far back is the house from the, the front boundary? I said, well, uh, 800 feet. He said, you've only got to build, if you look at the regulations, because I hadn't, only got to build back 60 feet, and then you don't have to build in brick, you can build in timber because it was for the, the, the chook house the chook. Or, right. <laughs> or, or something like that. Right. He, he changed my life because he had a word to Chipperfield, the building surveyor in Kew, and I got a permit within one hour. Fantastic. Changed my life. <laughs> I always then fondly the, yeah. <laughs> the Sunshine House. So I'm going to ask um, a last question of, of both of you. Um, if Robin Boyd was asked to design a new Sunshine House today, and if Robin Boyd was asked to do the Australian Pavilion at the World Expo in two years' time, what ideas do you think he would have promoted? And I'm, I'm putting you both on the spot. We haven't rehearsed this at all. No, no, no. Um, but, but an interesting I, question. It, it's a really interesting yeah. question. So in terms of the, the Sunshine House, what would Robin have done? And what, what might well, he have well, done for, yeah. an, for an expo? Yeah, one would hope that he would have been invited to do the building. And because Robin had a sense of the totality of architecture, you know, he didn't see it just as a shell that you look up from the street. He saw the shell, the interior, the furniture, everything as part of a coherent whole. And I think that's why he was so, he was sad and bitter that he wasn't asked to do Expo 70, 70. or Expo 67. Somebody else got the building. And I can remember sitting in that living room on a Saturday afternoon, and him really sad. I mean, he, he was a big person, he didn't, but he knew, he, he felt cheated of that. So hopefully he would have done the whole thing, and he would have used cutting edge technology. He would have been saying, you know, who can we talk to? Who, what are they doing over there? What the, oh, that was interesting. He, he, his mind was, was capable of just 
pulling in so many threads. Mm. And I think the exhibition, you know, I've been thinking recently that Robin was always in that loop of um, innovation and um, advocacy, you know. He'd innovate, he'd advocate, and one fed the other. And the exhibition is just the perfect medium to do that, mm. I think. Great. Mm. Well, <coughs> I often, people often ask, ask me, what, what would Robin think of Melbourne now? And uh, I often think of the influence that he has made on Australia and, and Melbourne in particular. Uh, I think the influence has been huge, but it doesn't mean that there hasn't been some failure and what his attitude might be today. If, we, if he was brought back today and we took him over to Turek, he'd literally rise out of his coffin in the projection <laughs> because of seeing what's happening. Yeah. It's just absolutely to the point of absurdity. So. Um, he he would he would be dissatisfied in the sense that he 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 would, could see how much he'd influenced people, but he could also see that we hadn't totally influenced people. Um, his own work, well, I I think all architects, other than Harry Seidler, change as they get older. Harry Seidler never changed. He he was what he was when he was 21, and when he died, he was the same when nothing changed. Uh, I mean, most architects are influenced by things like seeing whether their building has been successful and then trying to improve on it and, and watching and being careful to think. And as you do that, you, uh, you come up with different ideas and you, you change. Now, Robin, of course, was brilliant and he undoubtedly would have changed. He would have actually mm -hmm. had completely different ideas now, 50 years later, he would be thinking of all sorts of different things. Mm. And the circumstances themselves are different. He'd be facing different circumstances and different materials and different opportunities and different constraints. We have constraints today which are <coughs> entirely different from what we had 50 years ago. So <coughs> he would, he's, if he was given the Sunshine House to design today, it would be very different. Right. <coughs> right. Well, <coughs> Um, I'm going to bring things to a close, but I should just say a few words about the exhibition and its layout. Um, I was supposed to tell everyone to turn That's their the phones off, and it's phone. me. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, when you came, came in the front door, um, if you go immediately to your left, you would have gone into the ensuite, and there's work that shows. Um, Churchill House in Canberra, one of Robin's last buildings. And it's particularly pertinent as a place to start because that building is currently under threat in Canberra. Um, and I think it's more it's important that more people know about that, that particular building, at least visually, understand why there might be some uh, uh, issue uh, for keeping it. Um, and then the living room area is really devoted to expos. So take, take time, put the headphones on, and read some of the material. You can sit down on the couch and leaf through some of the material. When you come downstairs, if you go left into the kitchen, you'll see uh, an exhibition that Robin did at Harry Seidler's Australia Square, uh, the Australia the first 200 years. And the two colour images on the end walls are by Harry Seidler. So um, uh, they've, they've never been shown publicly before. But it does show, I think, the admiration that Seidler had for Robin's uh, design. Uh, you'll also then, um, upstairs, uh, I've neglected to mention, in the corner is a fish bowl full of little fish bowls. Um, and there's a fish bowl, uh, uh, Neptune's fish bowl, on the wall. Um, and I think where's, I'm not sure what the protocol is with the fish bowls. Alison, have we got a protocol with the capsules? And the fish bowls? It says, yeah, it to the Are you sure? Yeah, yeah right. apparently there's 200, but that's it. Yeah. <laughs> but only one. <laughs> no, only take one. Um, uh, and then down on the, lo the, the in the living room, uh, there's more work on the expos. There's also the, the um, Haddon Scholarship winning entry uh, that Robin uh, made in 1948. Uh, which is very well worth a look at. And Michael's uh, reproduction drawings are on the windows um, uh, just behind where the drinks are being served. 
Um, also, Yan Yu has just brought in her model of the space tube, which is Expo 70. Also on the um, uh, south wall, you'll see brilliant perspectives of unbuilt apartment work. And also, many of you may not realise that the painting, the Ashabilu painting at the end wall, actually appeared at Expo 70. Um, so there are connections here. Also, to up upstairs, I forgot to, to mention, is the, the Perspex uh, cylinders or half cylinders. That they, were, they, they looked like bookends, but they were actually used prototypes for the exhibition at the opening of the Australian Chancery in Washington, D.C. Um, so have a look at the very beautiful installation that's been uh, made up there. Um, also, too, some of you may not realise that here in, on this uh, south wall is a model and a little installation uh, to do with Tower Hill, the Natural mm -hmm. History Centre. Um, and along the other wall here, images of Stegbar window walls, not only by Robin but uh, by uh, Fred Romberg as well. And the back section of the house is really about the domestic uh, uh, idea of exhibition. Uh, the Peninsula House project, Ali and Michaela's work. And if you haven't touched the screen, and you can zoom in and out, it's mm -hmm. remarkable. They've documented as many Peninsula Houses as they could find in Melbourne. Mm -hmm. um, they're using cutting edge technology, and it's mm -hmm. a really uh, worth a look. And there's a fantastic model too that Sarah has done on the Stegbar windows. Uh, but also, uh, have a look at the House of Tomorrow and the Sunshine House. On the table, here behind me, there's a model of the House of Tomorrow, plus um, uh, Emma and Anna uh, reproduced the New Yorker, which was on the coffee table in the House of Tomorrow of 1949. And many of these things, please feel free to pick up, pick them up and, and have a look through. So a lot of them are reproductions, and the students have made special books, especially for the uh, exhibition. Mm. Um, then uh, Susie's room, the one on the right, has uh, Mike's, uh, Mike O's uh, uh, photographs and his drawings, and the catalogue has many of his photographs in there as well. Please have a look at those. Mm -hmm. And in the other corner is Apple Tree Hill uh, Estate, and um, Fatty's uh, uh, done the work on there. And there's a lovely little book of documentation too mm -hmm. um, of some uh, highs and lows of that particular uh, project. Mm -hmm. I've probably missed some people out, I hope I haven't, uh, but uh, it's been an extraordinary uh, process and please spend the time, uh, but most of all, let's thank Mary Featherston and Peter McIntyre for their time. Thank you very much.